Gomati, a very, very warm welcome to you uh, from Calcutta, where you are based. Uh, we're really delighted that you so spontaneously uh, agreed to give us a talk. It's a unique approach to art history. And when I read out your uh, brief bio data, our audience will know exactly what you've done and the path that you've taken and why I would like at this stage to say a welcome on behalf of the chairperson and the trustees of the CSMBS, the Director General, Mr. Sabya Sachi Mukherjee, on behalf of the Museum Society of Bombay, of which you're a member, and my own behalf, a very warm welcome to you, Gomti. Really appreciate this. Uh, Gomti, as you will hear, ladies and gentlemen, comes from a highly academic background and in education. But since retirement, and even while she was working, she had a great interest in art and art history. A few words about her and why we decided to do what we've done. We've had our members speak to us in the past. It started off in May 2020, a distant dream, when our very own member, Dr. Sophia Karanja, spoke to us about the Museum Society's trip to Humpy. And with excellent slides, we were all very nervous. Zoom was very, very new to all of us, but we took the plunge and I don't think we've regretted it because we've offered quite a variety of programs to all of you. Some audiences have been very loyal and have stayed with us through every evening. Some have picked and choose, which is rightly so. And we constantly have younger people joining us uh, to attend these sessions. So a few words about Gomati. She's been an educator for over 35 years in the field of school education, curriculum de development, and school management. Her school and college education were completed in Bombay at the St. Anne's High School on our very own Lady Kama Road in Mumbai and at Elphinstone College from where she graduated with economics in 1957. She moved to Calcutta, as it was then called, after her marriage in 1958. And except for a break of six years when she moved to Bombay to head the prestigious Bombay International School as its principal, where she formally retired in 1998 and found herself being offered a job. Very unusual, in quite difficult circumstances, she was asked to go to Nepal to set up a school from grade four upwards for Nepalese children on international methods of pedagogy, pedagogy and a holistic approach to curriculum that developed the mind and body in that idyllic environment where she worked for five years, idyllic but yet in a politically turmoil torn country before she returned back to Kolkata as we refer to it today. She received a Fulbright Fellowship in 1987 to the University of Minnesota for a summer study program for international school teachers, attending the program from different countries of the world. She also received an invitation in 1997 to attend New Wave Science Program for Teachers at the Schumacher College in Devonshire, UK for three weeks to orient into a new way of thinking and teaching science holistically in schools. She returned to Bombay International to run workshops for its science teachers and several other schools in South Bombay to learn about this new philosophy of teaching and learning all sciences as an integrated whole. From 2005 onwards in Kolkata, with plenty of time on her hands, as she says, she went back to take up a deep and abiding interest in ancient history, Indian history, temple architecture and iconography. She was greatly helped in this study by somebody who has been very, very dear to all of us at the Museum Society. She was a mentor to many of us, and I'm referring to the late Dr. Hari Priya Rangarajan, whom she also considers as a mentor and guide in this field of subject. Dr. Rangarajan introduced Gomati to the Indian Art History Congress, as she indeed did 
myself and several others. And in 2010, she presented her first paper at the annual art history conference in Kanyakumari. And since then has regularly made presentations on various aspects of ancient Indian art and its traditions. The last conference of the Indian Art Society, Heritage uh, History Society was held in Kerala University in Trivandrum in December, 2018 where Gomati's paper was much appreciated by the scholars present. I don't wish to stand between her and you, but I would like to say a few words about the talk you're about to listen to today. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll pause here and just say one thing. We've had scholars amongst us. They've come from to us. The one that pops into my mind because it was the most recent is Mr. Raghu Palak, who spent his entire career as a banker and then decided to write about the history of his family. And Raghu and his wife, Pushpa Palak, gave us a very, very interesting talk on the ruler of Prime Minister of uh, Trivandrum. And the book has been published and now he's going to write on his great grandmother. And I hope that we'll be able to have that talk as well. So we encourage our members, young and old, who have a passion for a subject which may not coincide with their professional career, we're happy to have you present your work because I think you're doing really true, true research and you really ought to share that. So this is a request for those in the audience or friends who are not here and pass the message on. If you have something interesting, we would be very, very happy to have you share this platform with us. So tales the temple tells. In the Southern Peninsula region of India, the state of Tamil Nadu occupies a central space with the Indian Ocean washing its Southern tip. And in the East, the Coromandel coast along the enclosed Bay of Bengal. Within this consider considerable space, Royal dynasties held sway over a millennium, warring for control, for power and influence. Nevertheless, whichever monarch prevailed over any length of time, he and sometimes she left behind for posterity the stamp of their authority, as can be seen even today in the towering temple structures each of the dynasties left behind and which have stood the test of time and weather over the centuries. I'm not speaking today, it's Gomati's platform. So I'll stop now and I'll offer my thanks to Gomati once more on behalf of all of us. And last but not the least, to our technical young team of Aishwarya, Mrinalini, Yashraj, ably led by our honorary secretary, Professor Jason John, who held our hand evening after evening and navigated the Zoom for not only for us, but for our speakers, so kindly, gently, and with such expertise. So tech team, thank you so much. And now I hand over the screen to y'all to share with Gomati Venkateshwar. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Dear friends and members of the Museum Society of Mumbai, it's a great honor and privilege to be here this evening at the invitation of Dr. Firoza Godridge and the courtesy of Dr. Sabyasachi Mukherjee, the Director General of the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastru Sangralaya. Doctor, it is an opportunity of a lifetime to be making a presentation this evening and I'm in total awe of the occasion. This short presentation this evening was originally part of a larger presentation done at the Indian Art History Congress in Trivandrum in December 2018. Whilst talking of the Indian Art History Congress, I'd be failing in my duty if I don't pay my respect to the dear departed president of the Indian Art History Congress, Dr. R. D. Chaudhary, who passed away a few weeks ago. I owe it to him too, as he was the person who made me a life member of the Indian Art History Congress in 2010 when I made my first presentation at the Kanyakumari Conference. 
And since 2010, I have been making, if not regularly, at least five major conferences where my paper was presented. And a year later, it was included in the color journal that the Indian Art History Congress publishes. I'm indeed very grateful and humbled by all this experience. Let me, before starting the uh, PowerPoint presentation, which will be put up on the screen, tell you the origin of this paper, how it all began. A year before a conference takes place, the Executive Committee of the Indian Art History Congress takes up a theme on which the members and paper presenters will work on a year before to make their presentation. In 2018, the theme was that Indian art is essentially narrative by nature. That was the theme. And we had to either work to confirm it or to dispute it in our paper presentation. Well, to do justice to anything that I would be presenting, I had to actually travel to Tamil Nadu, which I chose, to study temples to see if there is anything that could help me towards this conclusion of Indian art being narrative in nature. I chose, I arrived in Madurai, I think I was very intrepid in doing so, without knowing where or how to go about it, I just landed in Madurai. Now Madurai is a big city right now, very big, and the Meenakshi temple there looms large. It, it, it looms large in the lives of all those people who live in Madurai. But it was the ancient capital city way back in very early times, the capital city of the Pandyan kings of that period. So Madurai has a long history, and I based myself for four days in Madurai and asked around people who were knowledgeable where I should go to find some story in temples. They all looked at me and said, Madurai Meenakshi Temple. But I had been to the Madurai Meenakshi Temple three times before. I mean, as a child, when I was about 10 or 11, I accompanied my parents. And after that, too, I had visited it. I didn't want to take the Madurai Meenakshi Temple, although, of course, there must be big stories in those temple sculptures and painting. I was told to visit the Tanjavur, they call it the Great Temple, Periya Kovil. Koil, K-O-I-L, in Tamil means temple. They said the Brihadishwara Koil is where you should find a lot of material for your paper. So I made my way to the Brihadishwara temple. It's the temple that the great king Raja Raja Chola built in 1014 over a thousand years old, and it stands there so beautiful and striking. And I found what I wanted, but today's paper is not of that temple. 300 miles away from Madurai is a much smaller temple, and I was recommended to go there by a good friend of mine whom the, Mumbai, the Museum Society of Mumbai also knows very well, Dr. Nandita Krishna. I had called her on the telephone to tell her that I was in Mandurai working on my paper. And she said, have you been to the Avudayar Kovil? I said, no. She said, go there. If you are in Madurai, it's just about 300 miles. You take a trip there and come back the same day. And so I made my way to the Avdiyar Kovil, and that's where this story, which I'm talking to you about, makes its way into your notice and observation as to how strange the stories hidden in this temple is. I'm not going to be talking about the quality of the paintings in that temple or 
what it shows, but just the story that the painting reveals and the chisel sculptures. It just tells a lot of legends that are carved into it by our ancient craftsmen. How well those ancient craftsmen knew their art because they imbibed it from their forefathers and that fine sense of craft has been left behind for posterity. And devotees who come to the temple doing their perambulations do make a study of what they see around them and piece for themselves the legends and stories. If they know about it, then they make some headway or they learn it for the first time after seeing the fresco paintings and the stories. And the local people also are there to add in their bit. So this temple called Avreyar, which means a temple where the deity has no shape or form. The temple is dedicated to Lord Shiva, but you enter the temple, but there is no representative of that deity anywhere. Lord Shiva is not to be found anywhere in this temple. There is no image carved or the lingam, which is always there in a Shiva temple, it is missing. The Sanctum Sanctorum is just a small dark cubicle, which is empty in space. There is a base to which probably a lingam could have been added, but that is all. And so we need to find why this is so. The Shiva is missing and there is no sh the Nandi bull is also missing in this temple. Avdeyar Kovil also has another name to it, Atmanatha Kovil, which means a temple where the Lord of the soul resides. I was told by the local priest there, the priest who was in attendance that morning when I went there, in July of 2018, that the Shiva here represents ether, the air, the atmosphere, one of the five Panchabhutas. And so, in a short while, I arrived at that temple at 11 a.m. and I was told that it would be shut at 12 o'clock after the midday bhog or the midday meal would be served to the deity. I, would be, I was wondering what this would be because there was no deity. And I soon saw two priests carrying a large brass plate of steaming rice covered with a wet cloth enter the cubicle sanctum and shut the door. I was standing outside and I could hear temple bells ringing inside and after five minutes the two te temple priests came out and what I could see inside was just steam rising in the air and in Tamil the temple priest said, you do your obeisance here because that is what Shiva represents, the steam, the air. And I said to myself, what a strange concept, an empty space where the deity has been given his meal and the deity is represented by the steam in the air. It was just full of steam. And then the temple closed for the next four hours to open at around four o'clock. And I came back again that afternoon to do my more detailed study of the temple within, to study the fresco paintings and the sculptures that were profuse along the pillars and the walls of the temple. This temple is also called uh, Kudurai Swami Temple. Kudurai in Tamil means horse. So it meant that this temple is also known as the temple where the Lord of the horses resides. So the story of this temple is also about horses. And I would like the slide uh, to just show, we can begin uh, as I continue to speak, you can see a representation of this, 
the horse, the next slide will show probably a clearer vision of the uh, horse. Here you have. All along the temple walls, you have a caprescent, a highly caprescent horse, a, a horse which they call rearing horse or a rampant horse with a rider. And the rider holds a drawn sword or a spear. So the pillared uh, mandapas has these kind of sculptures of riders on horses. And the story that I'm going to talk about unravels how this uh, temple tells this tale. This small village a thousand twelve hundred years ago was a village called Vadavur in the Kumbakonam and Pudukota region of Tamil Nadu, belonging under the rule of the Pandyan king Varuguna Varman. Now that is another thing to be noted. Varugur, Varuguna Varman was the Pandyan king at that period of 9th century Christian era where the story begins. And he was a Jain king. Now that, of course, draws one's attention that here in Tamil Nadu, the Pandyan king belonged to the faith of the Jainas. Of course, which shows that the population could have been Jainas, Hindus and Buddhists at, the same, at that time because Buddhism was also prevalent as you know in, in later periods of the Chola history which is a neighboring kingdom that Buddhism was tolerated by the Chola king and then also much later was exterminated with force. Jainism and Buddhism later on disappeared from Tamil Nadu giving way to the big rise of Shaivism and the Vaishnavism in as a Hindu uh, as the Hindu kings enforced it. But at this period that we are talking about in the ninth century, it was a Jaina king, Varuguna Varman. This small village, there was a, a family of a well-to-do family with a young boy growing up, he was the apple of the eye of his parents, a Brahmin family. And it was noted by everybody that this child was extremely intelligent, almost like a prodigy. And the king of that time would send out scouts to various parts and districts of his kingdom to find out if the people were happy, if there was any complaint or any distress that he should take care of. And all these people who came back and reported to the king that here in this village of Vaduvur was this young boy growing up who showed great wit and intelligence. The king wanted to see it for himself. So if we can see in the slide, we have the king himself making a the king making a visit to this village where the brahmin family can we have the next slide please the king arrives the king arrives uh, with his courtiers uh, when the mother is uh, doting on this child on her knee and the king arrives actually in a, in a kind of a palanquin, you can see this, drawn by perhaps a bullock or a, a yes, or an ox cart. It's, but it's a king who steps out and much to the uh, flabbergaston of the parents as to why the king should arrive in their humble home. And he spends some time with the boy, talking to the young boy and finds him indeed uh, very, very uh, talented and with a very sharp mind. And he tells the parents that I would like to take this child to my palace to grow up and be groomed for bigger things. The parents uh, weep and say that he's 
our only support for our old age and if you take him away what will we do he says not to worry you can also come and live in madurai but the child will grow up in our palace and he will be given all the what he needs to have to take up a post in the palace as an official as he grows older so with much misgiving perhaps the parents let go of the child and the child goes back with the king to madurai and in due course of time the it comes about it bears fruit that the boy becomes actually the chief minister to the king or a chief advisor to the king news comes to the king that in the neighboring chola uh, uh, regions in the port city of nagapatnam a cargo of arab horses had arrived and the chola king was buying these horses for his army vaduvuran that was the name given by the king to this boy there was no other name the village was vaduvur and the boy who grew up there and who was brought to the palace by the king was vaduvuran that was how he was known as vaduvuran told the king that a king's might and name is known by the cavalry regiment in the army so if you are wise you too should buy those horses for your army and then you will be known for your power and might if you were to go to war so the king is taken aback by this and he ponders as how he can send his soldiers to buy horses from perhaps not an enemy territory but from a rival kingdom so he says well vaduvaran you shall go to buy the horses for my army because nobody will notice you you're a young brahmin boy and in those days the brahmin boys were maintained their their uh, skull uh, the the tuft of hair that was all on her head but the rest of the head was shaven and that showed that he was a brahmin boy and of course the sacred thread on a bare body so the king thought that if he sent vaduvaran to the port town of nagapatnam which was in the chola kingdom the port city of nagapatnam he would come away buying the horses not noticed so he gives a bag of gold and sends his so- some soldiers in disguise to accompany vaduvaran to buy the horses so this is where a whole series of incidents happen that changes the destiny of vaduvaran and the kingdom as well vaduvaran making his way to nagapatnam which is quite a distance away comes upon on this long journey a man sitting under a tree lost in a trance singing hymns in praise of lord shiva these verses and poems were so beautiful that vaduvaran leaves his the company of his soldiers and comes and sits down at the feet of the man old man an ascetic who was singing these verses with his eyes closed vaduvaran also was lost in the trance and then he opens his eyes and asks the old man that please teach me some of these songs this is what i wish to do learn from you but before he could even do anything else to his great surprise and astonishment he finds the old man had vanished there was no sign of that ascetic who had been just a little while ago singing songs in praise of lord shiva he looks around and finds nobody and the soldiers there get restless and come to find vaduvaran and say let us make our way because we still have a long way to go and vaduvaran says no 
this is not where I, this is where I'm going to stay because what has happened to me is the strangest of things. I have seen Lord Shiva himself. It was Lord Shiva who was singing and I'm going to start building a temple in his honor right here and now. So what he does is he, he goes around and asks people, local people to help him build a temple, a small shrine as to where this man, old man was sitting. And the soldiers are absolutely nonplussed and hurry back to the king to say that Madhuvaran has is playing truant, that he is not going ahead to buy the horses. And the king is so furious that he sends more soldiers to bring back Madhuvaran, arrest him and to see what has happened to his bag of gold. But meanwhile, Vaduvaran had given advance payment to people to start building or constructing the temple. So much of that gold that he had been given has disappeared uh, or given away. And he's put, if we can have the next slide, we'll see that uh, there is uh, Vaduvaran in a cage brought back. Next one, this is a, this is the ascetic or the uh, Shiva, it was Shiva himself who had come down to sing and, and that tree under which Shiva was singing, the, the priest when I went in July says this is still the same tree that Vaduvaran uh, found, there is an old tree, gnarled tree there and it has a name but I don't remember the Tamil name there. But uh, there is a tree and the temple, the Avrayar Kovil temple has that tree at, in the backyard. And, and there is, uh, if you carry on the slide, we can see Vaduvaran uh, put inside a cage. Here, right he is. He's brought back by the king's soldiers and put inside a cage. And punished and with severe punishment. But what happens is that every time the soldiers raise the whip to beat Vaduvaran, it's the king who feels the thongs hit his back. And Vaduvaran doesn't get the slightest pain. And it is the king who smarts under the whip. And he's then put for more torture. Actually, what happens is it was a the summer season and the Vaigai river in Madurai which flows through Madurai had gone dry and Vaduvaran is made to stand in the hot sand bed with bare feet uh, burning his feet and Shiva immediately to punish the king for this kind of torture sends a flash flood up the river that literally drowns the city and the king is completely, uh, you know, in, in panic that his city will get drowned by this furious flood that sweeps through the city. So he calls that every able-bodied man in his town must build the embankment, raise the embankments or they will be punished for it. So we see here everybody working and there is an old woman who has no children. So she, and then the king also orders that every household must have someone represent the household with the labor of building or raising the embankment to save this capital city. And this old woman is wailing that I have no one to help me build or to go and build this embankment because I have no children. And then again we have Shiva come as a young boy asking the old lady that if you give me some food and some shelter I will do your work from your household. And so he, he gets the food from the old lady and then carries the load of mud, which we say, which we see here doing. But the next thing that he does, I, I, can we have the next slide? I don't know if that slide is there. It was, no, this is not the slide. There was, there was a slide, but it was very badly frayed. So maybe I didn't include it. 
The story goes that that young boy, to test the king even further, just carries just that once the big heavy load of mud to build the embankment and then just lies down in the old lady's veranda and goes to sleep. And the soldiers finding the lazy fellow start beating him and that's when the king feels the whip beating him very severely and he cries out in pain and alarmed that he is being punished when the boy is sleeping, where is Vaduvaran? Vaduvaran was unharmed and then he realizes that this Vaduvaran was no ordinary mortal, that here he is a devout, devout bhakta of Shiva and that Shiva was protecting him throughout this episode of punishments. And what happens next is, of course, uh, it is there recorded that Varaguna Varman changes his faith from Jainism to Shaivism. So that is another socio-religious phenomenon that takes place in the 9th century in the Pandyan kingdom where a Jaina king changes or converts to Shaivism because of these uh, incidents and episodes that happened through the building of this temple and Aurear, or as the Kovil is. And one more test before this, these incidents was that Baduvarin was being asked, why did you not go to bring the horses? They were, we were in dire need of those horses to build up our army because there is a threat of war from our neighbors. And so it happens that Vaduvaran hears the voice of Shiva telling him, tell the king that in the month of Ashad, that is say July, August, under the star called Mula, which the 27 stars or constellation, on the night of the Ashad Mula Nakshatra, the horses will arrive in the stables. So the king is waiting for the horses to arrive and he hears thunderous hoofs of horses coming and what happens is the stable doors are opened and the horses are led inside and tied up. But what really Shiva had done was he had packed a, 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 a horde or herd of foxes or jackals in the forest, changed them into horses and brought them as horses to keep the word that Vaduvaran had told the king that you will have horses in the stables. But in the middle of the night, these horses turn, change back into foxes and start howling. And before one can do anything, they jump out of the stable doors and Neither the foxes nor the horses were seen again. So all these episodes tell the king that Vaduvaran is to be not punished but to be let loose or let freed so that he can carry on the worship of Shiva and the king himself helps in the construction of the temple of which Vaduvaran had started. And once the temple was finished, it was a small temple, and in centuries later, each succeeding generation of the Pandyan king annexed and enlarged the temple to what it went on till about the 15th century, 9th century to about the 15th century, continuing construction of the te uh, temple made it what it is today. It doesn't have a very tall gopuram, it is rather squat as one may say when you compare it to the towering gopurams of Madurai or the Brihadishwara temple. It's a, it's a smaller gopuram. But the story of the horses is represented by the series of horses that form the pillars. It's actually uh, the pillars are 
in the form of uh, rampant horses or rearing horses. And, and so it was also another thing that I uh, had made note of at one of the Museum Society lectures a few months ago, another lecture of a person who had said that in the West Coast in the, the, in the 12th century, horses were traded, brought by, from Arabia probably by Arabs to trade to the Gujarat kings or the Maharashtra kings horses. Trading in horses used to take place to build up their army. So I had made note of it and maybe I even mentioned it uh, at the time to the speaker that, uh, well, in the Chola Empire in 9th and 10th century, Arab horses were being traded. And not only that, what, what uh, the story of this Avriya temple tells is that it was not only the horses that were purchased, that there were mercenaries that came with the horses, and that was a bonus for the king when they purchased the horses. It came with a soldier who was a mercenary, mercenary and who would be an able-bodied soldier to you know, join uh, the regiment or the cavalry, a uh, trained cavalry uh, soldier, uh, because these horses coming from abroad needed somebody who knew their horses well before they could be trained by for local horsemen too. So that was the bonus also that um, this uh, Varugura Varman was told that when you go to Nagapatnam to buy the horses, you will also get a mercenary soldier along with each horse. So that was why he gave a big bag of gold to Vaduran to go and get the horses and the soldiers. But it never happened. Maybe later the horses came in, um, but the construction of the temple was taken over by the king and we have the temple also uh, completed by the king himself. Meanwhile, Vaduvaran had found what he had wanted always to do, be a bhakta of Lord Shiva, and he now becomes the Tamil poet saint Manika Vachagar, who is one of the 63 pillars of Tamil poetry and literature. His poems, a thousand verses that he composed thereafter, living in the Avriyar temple, he becomes a resident in this temple, composing hymns in praises of Lord Shiva and adds to the body of Tamil literature. Uh, Tiruvasakam it is called and uh, today every uh, Tamil scholar learns these poems of Manika Vachagar as a mandatory uh, reading or learning when you do the study of Tamil literature. And uh, these poems have, uh, Tiruvasagam, it is also, uh, you know, referred to in the Sangam literature, in the, in the discussions that used to take place, the debates that used to take place in ancient uh, Tamil Nadu when the Sangam gatherings used to take place. They say it is so ancient that the first Sangam a gathering, they have dated it to 2nd century BC and continued the 2nd Sangam, the 3rd Sangam, right up to 4th century Christian era. So the Manika Vachagar, although he, I can't see how it could have happened, but the literature seems to abound in references to Manika Vachagar's uh, poetry in praise of Lord Shiva, and they formed the corpus for the Shaiva Siddhanta cult, the, it is a special kind of Shaivism which uh, has these kind of uh, poems, uh, great praises of Shiva and his attributes and his, um, you know, what you might say, the leelas that he performed. So this temple, we come to realize, carries with it so many stories and legends. And the paintings that I went around to see, that is another thing that struck me, 
is the framed uh, fresco paintings. They are repeated. They are not in any chronological order. So one has to go from uh, place to place or, uh, around the thing trying to piece. It's like a big jigsaw puzzle and you, with my camera, I just took pictures that later on I connected to form the story because they are not in any uh, narrative stage. I had to make the narration for myself. Uh, and the same frame or the same painting is repeated several times. And I would think that maybe uh, each generation of uh, painters try to make that uh, painting better or improve on it. Because some of those paintings are very fresh. I mean, the colors are more vibrant, whereas perhaps the earlier painting is frayed and I left out those paintings that looked frayed and worn off and took ones that looked much better in these slides. So I would, uh, you know, just a minute, I, I yeah. Yeah, so this is how the story, I, I was, I think, lucky that I chose this temple uh, for my paper narration. I had three other temples that I visited in my stay in Madurai, made, of course, the big journey to Tanjavur, where the great paintings of the Chola period of course, they are now not to be shown to the public because they are so badly uh, frayed that the Archaeological Survey of India has put them away. That corridor, the dark corridor surrounding the Sanctum Sanctorum is uh, prohibited for visitors. But instead, what they have done, they have uh, the Archaeological Survey has taken uh, photographs in their camera of those paintings, the great paintings of the Raja Raja period, Raja Raja Chola period, and put it in an annex, like a museum annex adjoining the temple for the visitors and tourists, so that they will not miss out seeing what the Archaeological Survey of India finally could do, because there was no trace of the paintings that Raja Raja Chola and his great um, uh, you know, the uh, Acharya, the great painter and uh, architect who built the temple, who had made those paintings, uh, had left behind because the 17th century Na Nayakar of Tanjavur, they started painting on those walls and covered up the Chola paintings totally. So there was no trace of the Chola paintings to tell stories that they had also left of that period. But I think uh, the archaeological survey did some marvelous work of restoration where they were able to remove the Nayaka paintings, uh, uh, paintings of the 17th century of the Tanjavur kings and reveal the Chola paintings in its purity for a short while at least because it had lain under the paintings of the 17th century Tanjavur kings for 400 years almost, 400, 500 years. So that was uh, uh, very, very pristine uh, for the short period that it was exposed to, but quickly faded away till it was realized that they could not allow it to disappear totally. So they, they framed those huge paintings and put it in the museum annex for visitors like me to then, you know, gather whatever we could. Uh, at least I did for my painting. So my paper was in three parts for the Trivandrum conference. And I also did one of the Sitanavasal cave, rock cave. It's a Jaina cave where the uh, attainment of uh, Nirvana of the 23rd Tirthankara has been captured that very moment of bliss has been captured on the ceiling of the rock cut cave of Sitanavasal, which is a, a gigantic uh, rock which stands in the plain uh, uh, of the plains of Trichnopoly, you know. And one has to climb the cave, it's a bare rock. 
and uh, Tamil Nadu's uh, weather is not the best for climbing or hiking. So one has to have the, the what shall we say, the, the, the energy to fulfill that. And once you are inside the cave, uh, you are you're blessed to see what beautiful paintings were carried out. This is fourth century uh, Christian era, the Jain monks who lived there as ascetics, they painted on the walls and in the ceiling this moment sublime of uh, the Tirthankara attaining. And then uh, while he's uh, getting that enlightenment, he enlightens the people around him uh, to talk about what he has perceived or received uh, in that moment of enlightenment. So uh, for me, my paper, the three papers, you know, the Manika Vachagar at Avrayat temple also in his old age, the legend goes that he walked into the empty sanctorum and was never seen again. So he attained moksha in this Avrayat temple in his old age. The Chola uh, Brihadishwara temple, the, the great painting on that wall also reveals a story of another a poet saint called Sundara Murthy, who also rides a white elephant across the skies and receives moksha as he travels to Mount Kailas. And that poem, that painting is rendered most beautifully, but it is also frayed. But one can see it because one of the cameras captured that painting whilst that painting could still be seen in a good condition way back in 1950s and it is now in in the Kalakshetra school uh, in the library of the Kalakshetra school and uh, that is where I was able to ask the principal of the Kalakshetra Dr. Revati Ramachandran whether she could be good enough to send me a copy of that and she did it so magnanimously. So that uh, painting I also uh, took in my PowerPoint presentation for my Trivandrum. So both the, uh, the three stories that I revealed in my paper was on moksha. So Indian art is narrative in nature definitely and for me I was lucky that I got the theme of moksha uh, randomly. I mean I, it was no planning that all the three temples had a story of moksha to tell. So with that, I uh, say thank you very much for listening to me so patiently. I hope I've been able. And the Avriya temple has this Manika Vachagar. You know, it's so strange. He was a devotee of Lord Shiva. There's no Shiva in this temple. The deity that is worshipped is the poet Saint Manik Kavachika. So this is the deity that you find at Avriyar Kovil. And he and this is an Utsava Murti that it's taken out twice a year in a chariot around the streets of uh, this temple town, Avriyar town in uh, Pudukote, on two festive days. Uh, Manik Kavachika is the poet saint who is worshipped as, as the deity of this temple. So it is a very strange story and, uh, and I, I think I was also very blessed to have had this wonderful experience. Thank you very much.